Looks like it's working. I feel like a rock star now. Uh, welcome to this fourth and the last colloquium in our series for this semester. For some of you who may not know who I am, my name is Nara Simon, and I work with Linda Vida here of the Water Archives and with the help of a few other faculty colleagues, we just put together this uh, colloquium for our common education. And today, uh, you are going to know something many of you may not know uh, about all the fantastic manifestations of water in California. Most of us have been only exposed to water politics and all the interesting fight that goes on. But today we are going to learn about s some of the most extraordinary natural phenomena related to water uh, near Santa Rosa. I don't want to give all the details. That is our speaker's thunder today. Um, not only a natural phenomenon, but the engineering that has gone to it the adaptation of the society that has gone with it. It's a, absolutely a fascinating story, which is very unique in the whole world. And to talk about that today, we have Tom Box, originally trained as a geologist. He had a couple of years here at the Berkeley campus, too. And Tom has spent almost 30 years at the Geysers Geothermal Field in Santa Rosa. And he is now vice president of uh, geothermal Resource Development and Management of Calpine Corporation, a premier geothermal uh, company. And he knows more about the uh, geothermal field uh, at, uh, at the Geysers than many people. And here today we are really in for a wonderful treat about something so unusual about water we didn't even know it existed. Many of us don't even know it existed. With that brief introduction, it's my pleasure to invite Tom Box. Thank you. Can you I guess you can hear me all right, because I can certainly hear myself. Uh, as, uh, as Nari indicated, I've been uh, in the geysers for a long time. I, actually started as an exploration geologist uh, after spending a few years in the mining industry I uh, decided that uh, all that moving and travel was too much for me and uh, the uh, I had an opportunity to get in on the ground floor so to speak in the geysers this was in 1974 at the time of the uh, Arab oil embargo gas lines gas rationing and to some degree I'm sure you all or most of you might remember that. Um, alternative energies were important then. Uh, it was called alternative energies. They were domestic. They, uh, they weren't subject to the wild fluctuations of uh, the Arab states. Uh, the pricing was stable. This was the theory anyway. And there was a, a big push to develop geothermal energy in the US. And I fortunately happened to be working for, uh, looking for work at that time. So ended up uh, working in the geysers. Uh, what I want to go through today is, is basically summarized in the, in the title. Um, since I'm a geologist, the nature of the geysers I'll, I'll look at from a geological perspective. Uh, it's, it's a very unique geological resource, being that it is in one of the world's most unique geological environments, the coast ranges of California or of, uh, of the West. And it, it's, a, it's a pretty incredible water project, really. We produce vast amounts of water as steam and generate power. Uh, and I'll go through how that all evolved. The development of it, as I said, began in 1974 when, uh, well, it actually began before that, but. Uh, from my perspective, it began in 74, the real development did, uh, stimulated by uh, 
uh, the economics at the time. But that development is a two-edged sword. There was such an aggressive development that really it caused uh, premature depletion in the resource. We were, began to dry up the field. So uh, to preserve it, to enhance it for what I think is a significantly long term, uh, we began to explore uh, water injection as a means to continue to mine the heat. Uh, the, the picture that's in the back is kind of interesting. Uh, there was a, a surveyor, a US government surveyor, who uh, came to the geysers in about 1850, and he was an artist. And he uh, was so impressed by it that he ended up sketching a number of uh, areas in the geysers. And we found these, actually the Geothermal Resources Council uh, an industry organization found these drawings in the University of Rhode Island, and we brought them out to the uh, to the west, and and actually have gone around and found the spot on the ground where the artist stood, where the surveyor stood to draw these pictures, and then taken photographs today. Uh, this is interesting, but it's kind of a plug for our visitor center as well uh, in Middletown, up off of Highway 29 north of Calistoga. Calpine has opened a, a pretty first-rate visitor center that showcases geothermal as a whole, but geysers in particular, and you'll see some of this uh, at the visitor center. Geothermal energy uh, requires heat, usually heat that results from volcanic uh, activity in the area. The ac volcanic activity occurs throughout the world in linear belts that are primarily plate boundaries. I'm sure you all know of plate tectonics and, and how the Earth can be roughly broken into seven, seven major plates. The uh, geothermal areas and the, the volcanic areas are really outlined in red here. And you can see how throughout the world, Wherever there are plate boundaries, there are uh, geothermal manifestations. And in many places, geothermal uh, power plants have been, have been constructed. Geothermal resources have been found and plants have been constructed. The geysers, of course, is in the western part of North America uh, and along the uh, eastern end of the Pacific Plate. As uh, the Pacific Plate obviously is part of the tectonic system that results in the San Andreas, uh, also the Clear Lake volcanics, the Sonoma volcanics, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but the geothermal plants around the world, I think far and away, the Philippines and Indonesia are what has been termed by different folks as the Saudi Arabia of geothermal. These are areas where active subduction is occurring and there's a lot of uh, volcanism, active uh, volcanism, and many, many uh, geothermal manifestations and geothermal reservoirs. Just a, a, the geysers is the largest in the world in terms of output and in terms of area. I'll show you a little bit later the geysers covers about 30, 35 square miles of uh, the coast range, the, the reservoir, uh, and produces today about 1,000 megawatts. Uh, major geothermal reservoirs exist in uh, Cerro Prieto in Mexico. This is just south of the California-Mexican border in northern Baja, out on the delta. The Philippines has, uh, as I mentioned, uh, major geothermal reservoirs, two of the biggest on this list. Lardarello is important because, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but the, the geysers is, is not only is a geothermal reservoir, but it's a steam reservoir, a dry steam reservoir. It, it just produces steam. When we drill wells, we don't see liquid water. Um, we just produce steam. In, in most other reservoirs, Cerro Prieto, the Philippines, the, you, you're essentially drilling into a hot water table and you produce water and steam, separate the steam at the surface, it generates the electricity, 
and the water goes back into the ground. Uh, but the geysers doesn't. And the only other major reservoir in the world also that, that is a dry steam reservoir is at Lardarello, Italy. Uh, you can see it's about half, currently about half of the, uh, the geysers capacity. The Lardarello is far and away the oldest, though having begun commercial operation in 1910, and it's, uh, except for a few years when it was bombed to oblivion during the Second World War, it's uh, still producing today. In California, uh, we're fortunate to have some of the world's major geothermal reservoirs in addition to the geysers. The geysers is here, about 75 miles north, northeast of uh, San Francisco. <clears throat> it's uh, located, as I mentioned, just in the coast ranges west of, or excuse me, east of Healdsburg, about 15 miles at the crest of the coast ranges, actually. But these other labels on here show you locations of other geothermal reservoirs. In California, there's a, there's a major hot water reservoir, one that produces water and, and separates steam off of it. Down at the China Lake Naval Weapons Center in Inyo County, uh, the Kozo geothermal field, and a very interesting project down here at the, on the south shore of the Salton Sea produces, uh, has, uh, a very large geothermal reservoir uh, of very briny fluids. Some of the fluids in this, uh, in this reservoir are uh, 10 times saltier than seawater. Very, very briny. So they have their own problems with production and scaling and corrosion, as you might imagine. And then, of course, uh, Cerro Prieto, that large Mexican field, is just to the south. Nevada also has a, a, a large number of geothermal reservoirs, but generally a small number. <clears throat> the geysers was first discovered in 1847 by uh, a fellow who was uh, part of John C. Fremont's expedition. He was hunting uh, grizzly bear, and his name escapes me, Bill. It's not important, but in any event, that's what you get for being old. Um, but he, uh, he discovered this region. Uh, it was a, along a creek, along a northwest trending drainage in the coast range, uh, about uh, five miles of fumarolic activity, uh, steaming ground, bubbling springs, mud pots and the like. He likened it to the gates of hell. Uh, this is a picture of gates of hell taken about 1920. Um, it was so popular at the, the last half of last century to, to more or less take the cure, to, be a, uh, to, to go to these kinds of areas throughout the world. Um, but Hot Springs, Arkansas was, was big. There, these were areas that were more impressive to people and more uh, important from a recreation standpoint than uh, uh, Yosemite, in fact. At this point in time, 1850, 1860, this was the premier resort in California, premier enough to them to have them build a, a, a hotel at the, in the area that uh, was, could hand, handle 200 guests. Uh, to get to this, however, uh, you have to be to the geysers to really appreciate it. To get to this, there were some uh, very, well, initially it was just horseback, and then there were some very rugged, uh, stagecoach roads. Um, I think it was in 1860 when the, the state geologist, a, a fellow named Brewer, he, he rode his, his horse into the geysers to stay at the resort. And after a hard, long trip, it, he encountered a hotel in which the prices were exorbitant, according to him. And when he saw the geysers' manifestations in the creeks and drainages around them, he said, this is all it is. There's no real geysers. It's just steaming ground. There's no eruptions. Uh, so he came away with a conclusion which uh, he wrote about later that the geysers was vastly overrated. Um, but nevertheless, for about 50 years, it was, a, it was an important place, uh, important destination. Teddy Roosevelt, uh, Ulysses Grant came to this location. 
It's interesting, its demise in, uh, in the early 1900s, there was some problems with fire and, and some of these other things, but one of the things that happened is the, uh, uh, that these kinds of facilities, taking the cure in these hot baths and all, was considered a cure for venereal disease. Uh, and so if you went to one of these places, they perceived that you had disease and you needed to be cured. So it, it, it's sort of a self-defeating uh, situation. And then there was a major fire, I think about 18, uh, 1915. And when I visited this, I was actually uh, here in the geology department in the early 70s. I visited the geysers initially uh, with a professor who uh, is not here, I'm sure he's retired now, Fred Berry, on a field trip. And uh, uh, what we found was just a large number of naked hippies in, in the area of this old rundown hotel. So now none of this is around. The hotel's gone, it's all gone, but it uh, has an interesting and somewhat colorful history. In, uh, as far as power generation goes, which is what I'm gonna talk about, uh, it, it, the wells initially were drilled in, in 1920, 1921 to 1925, I think eight wells were drilled. Magma Power Company, a, a group of entrepreneurs from actually San Francisco drilled these wells. Uh, they envisioned electrical power for Healdsburg or Cloverdale, but really the economics of that and the, just the remoteness of the site precluded them from doing that, so they built this power plant, which is about a third of a megawatt. Uh, it was here to generate electricity for the hotel, and from about 1935 to 1938, that's what it did. The old uh, generator that's in there and the, and the steam turbine, if you will, that, that uh, was used to spin that generator is now at our visitor center. Uh, we uh, spent some effort to restore it. Unfortunately, uh, one of the previous owners of the geysers thought it wise to bulldoze this building, so it's not around. Uh, so that's a little bit on the history. The, the geysers itself is, as I mentioned, it's located north of the bay, about 75 miles, in the coast ranges. It's uh, the outline of the commercial reservoir is is like a footprint. If you you probably can't see it, particularly from the back, but I'll show some other slides where it, it's a it's a uh, reservoir with a long axis of about 10 miles and a, uh, across about three to four miles. So it covers about 30 square miles, right in the crest of the of the Myakmas Mountains. The average elevation is probably about 2,500 feet, varying from its low point around 15 to 1,600 feet in the valleys to its high points over 4,000 feet. And so we have 21 power plants scattered around this resource. Uh, we produce 425 steam wells and operate about 50 water injection wells. So it's a big facility. I've got a couple of pictures that'll show you here. The, uh, the thing, one of the things that makes it from a geological perspective very interesting is that the, the reservoir is in a place where really there shouldn't be a reservoir. Uh, the Franciscan rocks, which are old Jurassic to Cretaceous rocks, are essentially impermeable. Uh, they're the rocks that make up the coast range by and large. They're in, essentially impermeable. Uh, so there's really nowhere for obviously the water to reside uh, that creates the steam. The geology is extremely complex, uh, very difficult to drill in it because it's subject to caving and, and other drilling problems. Uh, and yet it exists here um, in this setting and uh, really has been uh, a real commercial success for us. <clears throat> what I want to talk about just a little bit is, is some of the regional sort of geology. Uh, is in terms of the Franciscan, I'll, I'll mention that uh, a little bit more in a minute, but basically the Franciscan rocks are rocks that were developed in a subduction zone, it, where in a place where the Pacific plate was being driven underneath the North American plate. And these trench deposits, these gray wackies as we call them, sandstones or 
green stones, which are oceanic uh, lavas, they were essentially scraped off against the continent and crushed and jumbled and metamorphosed and, and actually drug to quite deep depths in the earth um, before they were uplifted along the coast of California. And the Franciscan geology is shown in this cross-hatching and, and stippled pattern. I'll show you a cross-section in a minute. But then as you overlay to that the fact that volcanics that are actually begin well to the south down in uh, uh, central California, volcanics in the coast ranges, uh, basaltic rocks, rhyolitic rocks, uh, are actually throughout the coast ranges and Interestingly, they get younger and younger and younger and younger and younger as you move to the north. The youngest volcanics in the entire coast range are here in, in the Clear Lake, Lake County area. The Sonoma Volcanics, um, Mount St. Helens, the Palisades, the area around Calistoga, if you're familiar with that, uh, are all slightly older volcanics, maybe two million years old. Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting area just to the west of Mount St. Hel <coughs> Mount St. Helena, that uh, the, the Palisades, it's a, uh, I mean, excuse me, it's a, uh, a place where uh, ash has been ejected from Mount St. Helena and buried a redwood forest. And the redwood forest is now petrified, and the petrified forest along Petrified Forest Road is, is a pretty interesting place to go. Some, some very, very large petrified logs. But those are all older volcanics. The, the geysers, the heat engine that drives the geysers is uh, uh, the Clear Lake volcanics, which uh, range from about a million years to the present. <clears throat> and then, of course, if you move, interestingly, if you move east, the next volcanic edifice, which is a relatively young one, is Sutter's Buttes out in the middle of the Sacramento Valley. And then, you're in a chain of volcanoes that make up the southern tip of the Cascades, so, which are all very young. So you have a volcanic region ending here at Sutter's Butte, jogging over, and then continuing here in the geysers. But we've explored north in the coast range, looking for additional volcanics, additional heat. Really haven't, haven't found any. This is a cross-section across the, uh, actually, the Sacramento Valley is out here. Uh, it doesn't contain the Sierras. The Sierras are over in here. My purpose is to show you that in, when this Franciscan geology was being formed, rocks were being shoved under each other, basically, subducted into this trench. And the faulting the, that went on during this period is, is kind of in a cartoon way shown here, it's, it's more horizontal. It's, it's what we call thrust faults or uh, high, uh, low angle faults. And they emplaced rocks of different lithologies in these thrust blocks. They, they were stacked on top of each other, separated by faults. Uh, the, and actually getting more and more metamorphosed as you went up in the section. The, the lower rocks in the section look more like normal rocks. The higher rocks in the section up in the crest of the mountains were very exotic and uh, occur only in a few places in the world. The geysers is located right at the crest of the mountain. And to get to the reservoir, which is located in these lower grade rocks down deep, we have to drill down to those depths, which can be on the order of six to 8,000 feet below sea level but I'll, I'll mention a little more of that later. But, so you, you end up with a Franciscan geology being one that is, is creating kind of a horizontal slab of rocks. And then about 30 million years ago, the San Andreas system starts to develop. And that shown up here extending past Point Reyes through Bodega Bay and up off Point Arena. And it, it's in response to the, this part of California being sheared on a right, what we call a right lateral or right slip way. In other words, the, this block, if you're standing on this block looking across, everything else is moving south or to your right. So with this big shear couple developing, now the permeability is not horizontal, but vertical. And there's these cracks developing in the, uh, 
in the coast range that in response to this. The geysers is kind of elongated parallel to those cracks. So the, um, excuse me, the geysers down here. Clear Lake actually is also elongated parallel to that because all the valleys uh, are running in a northwest southeast direction. So you have this, first this system of horizontal faults, then this system of, of vertical faults that create the, the permeability of the system. Uh, to give you an idea of what I'm talking about in terms of the topography, out there in the distance is Clear Lake at about 2,500 feet in elevation lower than we are here. Here we are at the crest of the, the geysers. This is one of our power plants. Uh, this plant sits at about 3,400 feet in elevation. And you can see the other power plants off across the hills. Um, the pipelines typically that are supplying steam to the plants come from a number of wells. Imagine a wheel and the plants at the center, the axle of the wheel, and these pipelines are the spokes. That's the way uh, the system is built. The spokes aren't straight because the ground is very irregular, but this gives you a good feel for how big this system really is. It's, it's, it's huge. <coughs> in, uh, in Lake County, this is a, a little bit more about the volcanics. In, in Lake County, uh, which is northeast of the geysers, here's the geysers footprint. And in, in Lake County is the, is the primary heat engine for the geysers. Uh, initially, I think some of the USGS scientists believe that Mount Hanna may have some molten rock uh, at depth under it and that be generating uh, the heat which is driving the geyser system. But now theories are changing where it's rather than one single uh, magma body existing at depth, there's, there's multiple magma bodies. Um, the, the point of this slide really is, is to show you that, that down here in the geysers actually is the Cobb Mountain volcano. This is a dacite volcano about a million years old. Deep in the reservoir we see a big intrusive of the same age and the same chemical composition. So part of the geysers reservoir has been intruded by this, this body of uh, what's now solid but this what we call the felsite. As you go across uh, Lake County and up onto the south shore of Clear Lake, uh, lavas get younger and younger. Some of the lavas in the top of Mount Kanakti and up here in the north are just 10,000 years old, very, very young. The geothermal exploration in the 70s was scattered across this entire region because it was all hot. Uh, some of these deep wells, this well here and these wells here, Encounter, didn't encounter any steam flow, but encountered temperatures over 700 degrees. Uh, we're looking at these wells today in terms of artificial stimulation with water, trying to mine the heat, but our main effort is down in this area. These wells up in the north, now these are all vineyards. There's a lot of grapes grown in Lake County today. A lot of small parcels. The big parcels that were in existence when we developed this are gone. They've been subdivided and broken up and houses built. So. I don't think there'll really be any potential for further exploration up here simply because of, uh, because of that. Here's an outline of the heat flow anomaly. Uh, I won't go into really the, the heat flow units. But suffice it to say that this line is about five or six times background for this region and everything in it is uh, well above background in terms of heat flow. The geysers here on the south uh, west side of it is uh, a very high heat flow. Obviously, there's, there's heat flow almost to infinity as you get up into these, into these thermal manifestations. Uh, but this is a huge thermal anomaly. Uh, it's hundreds of square miles in area and uh, has a growing population living on it that now are beginning to, to realize they live in an area that's a little bit different than a lot of people live in. There's a lot of hot springs in this area. There's a lot of uh, earthquakes in this area, some of which we generate by our production and injection, but a lot which are just as a result of the volcanic uh, environment that they're, they're living in. Uh, now I'll just focus a bit on the geysers geology. Uh, I mentioned in the formation of the Franciscan rocks that you, 
you end up with these slabs separated by faults. Uh, they, they're melanges, which is a French word for mixture. This is, a, from a geological perspective, is very much a mixture. There are green stones, which are volcanic rocks, pillow lavas, uh, which occur all over. The, some of the best outcrops that I've ever seen are in Marin County and, and Sonoma County of pillow lavas. Serpentine, the state rock, is another common rock at the surface. Uh, this serpentine is interesting. It, 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 it has its own special problems when we try and drill through it because when it's under a high confining pressure, it flows like toothpaste. So when we get into these wells uh, and, and we can actually see the hole begin to close up behind us because of the serpentine's tendency to move, We've, we ran casing steel pipes over the serpentine, but that serpentine's still moving. And nowadays we're, we're fighting problems of what we call casing deformation, where the casing is being scrunched. And, and uh, so it's, a, it's a, uh, a very unique rock. Um, it also is interesting in that many parts of this part of the state, it, it gives rise to pygmy forests. Its soil quality is so poor that trees can grow on it for hundreds of years and only get to be this big. And there are some beautiful cypress forests where trees this high are 400 years old. They just go off across the countryside, wherever the serpentine barrens are, are uh, prevalent. From a cross-section perspective, this, it, it, here's these slabs I was talking about. As we drill deeper, the rock gets less and less metamorphosed, less and less exotic, and more sedimentary looking. It's still metamorphosed, but it, it looks uh, more normal, has a little bit of permeability. In our steam production, we, I've shown here two things. The, sh the top of what we call the normal temperature reservoir. This is a cross section across the, the short axis of the geysers. And this is the top of the normal reservoir, kind of a hump. Very shallow in some areas, very deep off in the flanks. But we also have a, a higher temperature reservoir down here. This is the area where steam qualities get up, I mean, uh, steam temperatures get up uh, over or approaching 600 degrees, in some cases higher than that has a different chemical composition, and I'll show you a slide on that in a minute. But, and then down deep, deep wells get into the fell site, this volcanic intrusive. If you take a cross section along the long axis of the, of the uh, footprint, it's kind of light, but you can see that the fell sites, the cross section I showed you before is right in here. But as you move south, the fell site gets shallower and shallower, and the, what we call the main gray wacky is basically gone, and down in the southern end of the field, we produce from fractured felsic rocks, uh, which is a different, a different uh, kind of geology. We have a different steam quality down there, a, a better, cleaner steam. Uh, but overlying everything and, and acting somewhat as a cap is this mixture of uh, highly metamorphosed Franciscan rocks that exist in the surface down to about 4,000 feet. So our, our model of the reservoir, just conceptually now, is, is that uh, you have this geyser's cap rock that's composed of these complex uh, and unique rocks um, that basically are underlain by this silicic gray wacky or this altered sandstone. And that sandstone really doesn't have much porosity, 3%, 4% maybe. It's, as far as we know, it, it, it's, and, and the estimates are, it's as much as 40,000 feet thick. So there's, there's a big thickness of it. We've never seen in the bottom of it other than when we drilled into the fell site. Uh, but when we drill these wells, we encounter fractures in the gray wacky that are filled with steam. And the, what we believe is going on is as we reduce the pressure in these fractures, the steam, the, the water that's in these blocks as liquid boils into these fractures, moves to these wells and is produced. Uh, this water is all meteoric water. A lot of people early on thought this must be volcanic water, but it's, it, it, it's 
much more chemically in tune with, with a meteoric composition. In fact, in, uh, in our models of the reservoir, uh, it looks as though the, the source of influx to the reservoir was uh, from the south. But there's some interesting things about this. It's, it's, it's meteoric water, but it's not at hydrostatic pressure. I'll talk about that in a minute, but it's, uh, it's not in communication with the surface, but it exists down in these deep gray wackies uh, as liquid and, and steam in some of these cracks. But early on we saw, when we shut these wells in, we saw fluid levels, water levels build in the wells, but now uh, everything is very dry, pressures are very low, and so we don't see water really at all. Uh, a little bit about the, uh, the reservoir that's, that's interesting. There's actually, this table actually is, is shows you the normal reservoir, which exists above the higher temperature reservoir. Its average temperature is about 470 degrees. The deeper, higher temperature reservoir, which exists mainly in the north, is over 500 degrees. This is sort of an arbitrary classification. We've measured temperatures as high as 650 degrees. But what's interesting is in initial conditions, the, the pressure, and I'm, I'm speaking now of pressure in the earth down at sea level, which in this area is about 4, 000, three or 4,000 feet down or deeper, the, the pressure is 500 PSI, which is, is basically the vapor pressure of water at this temperature. So there's, if, if, this, if this resource were in connection to the surface, you would have pressures, hydrostatic pressures, at depths of three or 4,000 feet of, of two to 2,500 PSI, 2,000 to 2,500 PSI, but we, we don't see that. And even in the deeper uh, reservoir, the initial starting pressure is very much subhydrostatic. This is a, a real anomaly because that means that you're not currently connected to the surface and therefore rainwater, a lot of people say rainwater is recharging the reservoir. It's not. I mean, if it is, it's doing it at a very, very slow, slow pace. Um, and so this is one of the unique phenomena, but kind of keep this in your mind. I'll show you something here in a little bit that bears on that. The, the other thing that is important here is the volume. We've got, we've identified about 60 cubic miles of rock that's at 470 degrees. Our wells have open hole sections of four or 5,000, maybe as much as 7,000 feet. So this is a vast resource of, of hot rock and, and really on the high temperature side, we're just getting to know this, this beast. Uh, we, it's deep, so we don't really understand it, but it's uh, porosities in the rocks are very low. An interesting phenomena is the, the non-condensable gases that we produce. Uh, a lot of CO2 primarily, hydrogen sulfide is also a component, but in the normal reservoir, they're, they're relatively low, uh, 0, 0.05 to 2.5 percent, but in this deeper, higher temperature reservoir, they get up to almost 10 percent, which makes the economics of this uh, a, a bit difficult. And also, the deeper reservoir is known for its production of hydrogen chloride, an acid, which is a problem for us on the well casings. i just show you this as a typical drilling operation. Uh, as I mentioned, these, these wells are drilled quite deep, average about 8,000 feet, 12 and a quarter inch open hole to that depth from about 4,000 to 8,000, and this encounters these steam fractures which, uh, which produced to the surface. The wells cost us about, to a, a single well cost us about $2.4 million to drill. So it's an expensive operation. Um, when we began production, uh, one of the processes we have in the power plant is that in order to cool the incoming steam, we have to have a source of cold water. Well, that cold water comes about from condensing the steam and then evaporating it to cool it. So these, you get these nice plumes coming off the cooling tower, and that's providing us a nice source of water to cool the next increment of steam. But it's, these are our reserves, and they're going up into the air. 
this is a particularly interesting slide. The fog is coming in from the Pacific and the steam plumes from the power plants are piercing that fog. So there's all kinds of condensation and processes going on there. Um, the, the history uh, of the field is, is kind of interesting. The, uh, but I think what I want to say mostly here is that during the 70s and the 80s, you can see this is, this is a production curve in billions of pounds per year. Um, we peaked in 1987 at a, at a total of 200 billion pounds. That's about 80 million gallons a day of water. If you condense it, that's about 80 million gallons a day of water. Right now, we're producing about 100 billion or about 40 million gallons a day of water. So there's a lot of water coming out of here. Uh, injection of the, the condensed steam that's left after the evaporation process makes up about, in this case, about 25 billion pounds or about 25% of the mass we produce. In 1980, we began to augment the, uh, this flow uh, with water from the nearby creeks during, the, during uh, the runoff, during the high rains and the winter months. And you can see that there's a blue element here that's creeping in. In 1997, we, in our struggle to get to replace more mass, uh, we began to bring in some effluent, some treated, secondary treated wastewater from Clear Lake and uh, some water from Clear Lake itself. And we augmented the production even further, which is shown here. This shows you the percent of the mass produce that we replace. And right now, we're working on about 45, maybe 50%. So we're not replacing 100% of what we're producing, but we're trying to add to it. Uh, this is actually through 2002, so it doesn't show you the, the benefits of added water. One of the, uh, the Santa Rosa water. But one of the things that, and I probably move along here, but the, uh, as a result of all this production, these 200 billion pounds a year, 80 million gallons a day, uh, we've depleted the reservoir. The 500 PSI isobar is now way out here on the periphery of the field. Uh, here's that long footprint. There's the footprint again. At the center of the field, pressures are down around 150 PSI, but the rocks are still 470 degrees. So what we're doing now is trying to, find, to get as much water as we can injected into these low pressure areas where to generate more steam to support the pressure. We're actually drilling wells still out on the perimeter of the field because those wells still have enough uh, pressure to be able to, uh, to give us some economic returns. So we've, we've shifted from a production scenario where we were drilling, drilling, drilling our 425 wells to now one where we're, we're converting some of these wells to injection. Uh, the concept here is we inject water in areas and the water will move into the rock through those fractures, pick up heat from the rock and produce the steam to the offset wells. The, the trick we're finding is to develop these plumes around the injection wells, but not have the plume intersect the production well. If a plume gets to the production well, then trouble, scale and problems of that type. So what we've done is, this is a cross section that shows our steam wells uh, through the field, through a, a small portion of the field. Steam is shown in red here. This injection well in the center, we've actually this is an old production well, the deep production well. We've cased this well off and allowed water to only exit here. We're trying to put the water down in the very bottom of the reservoir so it has a, a maximum amount of time to exchange heat and produce as steam be drawn back in to the, to the lower pressure zones surrounding these wells. These wells are, are as I mentioned before, the, they're cased with steel pipe, multiple layers of steel pipe, actually to about 4,000 feet, then down to 9,000 feet or deeper. 
these liners are run with slots in the bottom. And these liners are solid all the way back to the surface. So when we inject, put the water down here, it goes out into the reservoir in this area, but can't go out in any other area. And this is, this has been, this is very important because uh, a lot of the residences in the area uh, are, are pointing fingers at us that their water quality is degrading and they're having, they're having problems with their wells, their wells smell. Uh, it's because they're in this volcanic area, but they blame it on us. Uh, the geysers now, as I mentioned, we have over 50 wells injecting water. Three different, in addition to the steam condensate, which is by every power plant, and as I mentioned, there are 21 power plants, we have zones of injection. In the south, we inject the water from Lake County. We put about 8 million gallons a day coming from Clear Lake and from the treatment plants over here. We have a, a zone along the creek where on rainy uh, days we can take water out of the creek and inject it in this blue area, average about 4 million gallons a day annually. And recently we have this new source coming from the city of Santa Rosa that you may have read about in the paper. It's uh, average about 11 million gallons a day coming in from the south. And I've got a few pictures of that as we go along. I think I'll skip that. And one, one interesting thing I might point out is this is the same graph uh, showing production in million gallons a day now. This is the 80. What's interesting here is this is the number of earthquakes per year generated. Uh, and you can see that as we ramped up this system, we generated a lot of micro earthquakes, uh, hundreds a day. 800 a day is fairly typical. And that's another environmental issue that we're dealing with. Again, the people who live in the vicinity feel as though we're shaking their houses apart. Um, but it's a, it's a part of the process, the geothermal process. I think I'll skip that one. Uh, another tool that we use in terms of trying to assess what we're doing with injection is tracer testing. We use tritium, the radioactive isotope of hydrogen, to, to tell us where the water is going. There's, there's really, initially there was no tritium in the reservoir. Uh, we put a slug of tritium in our injection wells and then in a group of surrounding wells monitor that uh, recovery. And in this case, we have seen in the span of one, two, three years, we've recovered about 75% of the tritium that we injected. So we know that, and that tritium is riding with the steam. I mean, it's, it's not differentiated really between steam and water, and it's, it's telling us that we're seeing a significant amount of steam recovery in the uh, surrounding areas. And this is a, a major tool for us to try and figure out what we're doing. Uh, Santa Rosa project is a, our, our new thing. It actually started up last week uh, they are, as we speak, delivering 12.1 million gallons a day of water through a 41-mile pipeline uh, coming from the city of Santa Rosa. Actually, Sebastopol participates, Katati and Rohnert Park all participate in, the, in this and have effluent into this uh, basin. They, the city of Santa Rosa pumps it to this area, well, actually to a tank that's located up in the in the geysers, a million gallon tank. This is an elevation gain of about a little over 3,000 feet. Uh, and there's three major pump stations along the way. We're providing the electrical power to run those pumps. Uh, but we feel that the benefit we're going to get from added steam more than offsets the amount of power uh, that we have to supply. Uh, interestingly, the amount of power that we have to supply to these pumps is uh, enough power to, to supply the city of Healdsburg with its needs. So we have a lot of, we, I, I don't think, maybe I didn't mention, I should have mentioned that the geysers generates about a thousand megawatts. I think I mentioned that, which is, is uh, enough electricity for about a million homes. And so the, the North Bay, actually all the way to the Eureka in that area, most of that power comes from the geysers. Um, out of that thousand or so megawatts, 
we produce nine megawatts to these pumps to give us more water. So you get a sense of the scale of the operation. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly big operation. The uh, uh, tank that I was mentioning is here. This is the terminus of the Santa Rosa line. Then our system takes it and we move it through the geysers, dropping it off along the way in various wells. We've just converted 10 new wells, which are very deep and uh, are now taking the bulk of the water in this northern part of the field. So this is tertiary treated effluent. So it's very high quality water. Some say drinking water quality, but I don't know if I drink it. Um, but it's very, very clean, very low TDS, perfect for us. We, we can use it in the cooling towers. Uh, and we're already beginning to see uh, steam recovery from it. Here's our, the terminus tank. This is a high point tank. Actually, uh, this is a view looking to the south. We take it from the city's tank, pump it to this tank, and then from here it's gravity flow throughout the mountains uh, through a system of 24 inch pipe that runs, I think there's 18 miles of buried 24 inch pipe that distributed around to our wells. So it's a truly... The wells they're not, they're, they take water on vacuum. We just pour it in the wells and they fall. Uh, fluid levels stay very, very deep. And the, because the reservoir is so under pressured, it's just taking water as fast as we can pour it in. In the, in the Lake County project, the one that's been in operation since 97, uh, we've, we've kept that really located in the southern part of the geysers. And uh, this is a projection of the benefits. Before we, before we started the project, we were seeing about a 25 megawatt a year loss in the generation from that part of the field. Pressures were depleting pretty fast. We began that project here, and I think to, to everybody's surprise, we started seeing the production go up, not just stabilize, but begin to increase. And then it, through the years, it's followed more or less along this curve. We're now in a situation where we're, we're about 70 megawatts greater than we would have been, uh, but we're in an area where decline is, is still occurring. I think the reason for this is we mine the heat out of these areas, so now it's time to move to other areas uh, to try and rejuvenate it and get back into this kind of a this kind of an affair. So that's all I had to say, and it's almost 50 minutes. Um, and I'd like to entertain questions if you all have any. We have plenty of time. You have half hour for questions, comments, whatever. Yeah. All of that water that gets injected back in is all down six or seven thousand feet before it goes out into the. That's right. And if you, this last slide showed the the uh, decline in energy in that particular area. You you taken enough of the heat out of the rock itself. With all this new water from Santa Rosa, you know, at what point does the do you start to take the heat out of the whole system so that that's that's a very important question and my boss always asked me that. Um, the I think there's there's a point where we can take too much water and we can start to cool things off uh, pretty dramatically. But we've been uh, I, neglected to point it out, but we've been injecting since 1969. We've had some pretty sub significant flows of steam condensate into the reservoir since 1969. And we've kind of evaluated the effects of you know, heat extraction in areas. And as big as the field is, we feel like we've got, with, with the commitment to move it around and to, to inject a little bit of water over a large area that we've got, we can sustain the life of this field economically for another 20 or 30 years. But if the, the city of Santa Rosa already, I mean, the thing's not even 
the bugs aren't even out of it, and they're wanting us now to take 20 million gallons a day. You know, it's like I told the, the folks the other day that it's like we had this giant Thanksgiving dinner and we're all full of turkey, and now they want us to go, we haven't even digested it, and they want us to go take more. So we're going to have some, some uh, have to do a lot of studying to understand how much water we can really take. I don't know at this point. Yes? Uh, two questions, sir. Sort of like did, did you mean that there were no hot springs uh, at the geysers? Because uh, people usually went to those hotels for hot springs. No, there, there are hot springs. There, there's quite a number of hot springs. Um, they aren't particularly uh, important or big. I mean, nothing like Yellowstone, anything like that. They're, they're, they're kind of small and, and actually very seasonal. In the winter, they're, they're bubbling and pretty active, but in the summer, they're steam. There's an almost no. It's just very shallow water being heated by very shallow rocks. And is Mark Revel having the same kind of depletion problem? Yes. And they're doing the same kind of water injection. I don't think they quite are up. I, I showed a slide there where we had a mass replacement up over 50%. Um, they're not there yet. But they're, they're adding water. Yes. I was wondering how many producers are there now if the state is up there, I believe, from the Board of Resources. And is PGE still operating? No. In 1999, Calpine uh, acquired all of the PGE plants and all of the Unical steam fields that uh, and they had all, Calpine had already operated in that area. They just essentially acquired everything. And so we don't have, uh, we sell power to the, the independent system operator here in the state. We don't sell steam to a utility. We don't have any contractual situations like they had for so many years. So it's a, it's a unitized or unified system now, which has made working up there lots better. The other part of my question is, uh, I imagine some of the many units that pg e had were shut down, at least temporarily. Have you been able to restart some of those now that you have uh, more steam? No, actually what we've done is we've, uh, imagine you know, the development inside that footprint uh, from a steam supply perspective was very patchy. Unical had this area, uh, Calpine had this area, another entity, NCPA, had this area. And we all work to develop our own areas and protect our boundaries from development or drainage by someone else. Well, when we acquired all these different areas now, there's no worry about offset drainage or any of that problem. So we've we basically built pipelines that cross tie these various, uh, I use the analogy of a, of a wheel with a plant at the beginning. Well, we've connected the wheels now so that we've actually found that we can shut down some plants, we just don't need them. Uh, move the steam from that plant into another nearby plant and we don't lose any generation. So it's, there's no reason. So some of the older plants have been closed and uh, abandoned actually. Yes? Can we get any age dating on the water, the water? You know, there has been some some recent age dating that was done by UCLA, but I don't know. Alfred, do you have any idea? I don't know the answer to that question. Well, before, as far I don't know what UCLA was doing, but tritium is the sort of standard, was the standard method. And, uh, except for the tritium that you guys put in from time to time, they never found any tritium. Right which indicated that they were dealing with water that was uh, at least 500 years old, depending on what model you use for the storage of water. Uh, because the tritium comes from bombs, but you can introduce a small amount of bomb tritium into a big reservoir and then get an idea of how long the average age of the water is in the reservoir. So now, pretty old. Nowadays, because of all the reinjection and all the recycling, it's just the, it's very hard to find original steam. You know, there's all. How are you distinguishing between condensate, stream water, and reclaimed water? Or 
what type we of aren't. chemical tags? We aren't. They're really, uh, there's no difference. I mean, the water that we get from Santa Rosa is basically Russian river water. It's been passed through the human body, maybe, but it's still Russian river water. Um, that enrichment of deuterium, right? Yeah, the condensate, there, was, there were chemical signatures in the condensate that, that we could use, the, the, the stable isotopes, but even that now is, is becoming a little bit more diffuse because of all this fresh water that we're injecting. So it's, it's those characters that we saw early on are, are, are becoming less obvious. So we're looking for not natural tracers, but uh, you know, introduce tracers. Yes. I was wondering, since you're now adding this Santa Rosa water, have you done modeling to predict what the seismic effects will be? We, can't, we haven't really modeled seismic effects. We, uh, our, our basic window into that is what the seismic effects have been from that first project that started up in 97. That project increased for a time increased the, the amount of earthquakes down around magnitude one, actually increased them by about 50% in this little area around where we were injecting for a time. But now that seismicity seems to be fading. So it's, it's not clear really what, we're in a different regime, a different, with this new water, we're going to the northern end of the field. It's deeper, it's a different geology. So we don't expect a huge impact but I think there will be some. He said, tomorrow night we have, an, we have a, a meeting with uh, the, the, the local residences in the area on particularly just this issue. You know, what they're, they're interested in is, you know, I'm feeling more earthquakes, my house is shaking apart, um, and I want somebody to take care of me. And so we're, it's a tough, it's a tough issue. How often do you have to change injectors? Injection life, uh, injectors last probably on average about seven years, five to seven years. And how long are you shifting injectors? Well, we're shifting it all the time. We'll, 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 put a, we'll, we'll, we'll inject into an area for, at 1,000 gallons a minute for a year, and then we'll reduce that to 300 gallons a minute. I move over. We don't stop injecting, we just go reduce way down on the flows. And we're adding injectors, so we're in kind of increasing the flexibility as we go along. Yes? Before you, uh, you had the uh, Santa Rosa water, was there, were there any environmental problems from using the stream water or getting that or the like water? <coughs> Is that an offset now? No, we haven't. There hasn't been any, other than the earthquakes, which I, you know, are an environmental issue, there hasn't really been any problems associated with that deep injection. There's, there's not any tendency for algae to form in our wells or any strange methane clouds forming around the geysers. That was one of the worries. I've been taking water out of the stream and having uh, dry streams. And oh, no. <laughs> Our permits uh, with the fish and game are, are keyed into, our, our ability to take fresh water is keyed into a, a USGS gauging station just downstream from the geysers. And when, when the geysers is in a, in a flood stage, I mean, and there's a, there's a lot of, I think there's 15 feet of water in the creek, we can take a certain amount. But it's, it's just taking the muddy stuff off the top. When that level drops back, we can't take it anymore. So we're, we're just truly taking the peaks in terms of the stream. So environmentally, no. We don't dry the streams up. Can you talk about how you generate electricity in the stream? Does anybody use it for the heat itself in the streams or residential heating? Is it too far down? It's, it's far away and, and no, nobody here uh, uses it for any kind of direct use, you know, heating and all. Um, it, it can be done. I mean, in Lardarello, there's these wonderful greenhouses that use uh, steam condensate from some of the power plants that, to grow veg or flowers year-round. But 
And there are, are geothermal fields which are more water dominated, which have a lot of water in their system that produce a lot of water. Those, uh, some of those uh, fields can produce, you know, heating for local cities, but the geysers, no, it's too remote. The geothermal plant in the Salton Sea was producing, trying to produce zinc. Uh, trying to produce zinc, yeah. And uh, the cap trying to think of extracting metal or anything like that. Well, in the, in the Salton Sea, I mean, the, you produce the periodic table. You know, there's, there's lots of elements, uh, not too much gold, but a lot of other elements, particularly because even though the concentrations might be low, the volumes of liquid produced are huge. In the geysers, it's steam. So it's, it's basically uh, dis on its, its distilled water in a, in a shape. I mean, the, our major constituent in our condensates are, are maybe boron, uh, a little bit of chloride. The, the TDS of the condensates is very small. So, and not seeing any water, we, we don't have really anything to, any economic minerals to produce. Any measurable amount of mercury? Thankfully, no. There is, there is some, and in these non condensable gases, in some of the plants, there is mercury, and, and we handle that by passing these gases through charcoal filters that extract the mercury, and then we can take the, uh, uh, the mercury off to the hazardous dumps. But they're very, it's very, very small. This is, uh, I forgot to mention, this is an old mercury mining district a fairly major mercury mining district. A lot of epithermal mercury all over the near surface, but uh, not in the steam, fortunately. That was a concern early on. That, that could be a real disaster if you had a, a lot of that. Um, now that you bring a tertiary water into those fields, do you still use um, like uh, creek water and volcanic water to also kind of manage? What we're, what we're trying to do, let me see if I can, well, I'm not sure I can go back there, but the, uh, what we're trying to do is get our mass replacement. In other words, we're trying to inject, we're up, up close to 100%. We're trying to inject uh, about the same amount inject water at about the same level as the steam we produce. And right now, we're, with the Santa Rosa water, we're gonna be in about a 75% mass replacement. So we're really not there yet. So we're using all the sources that we can muster. Stream water, clear lake water, and, and treated effluent. It looks like the future is gonna be more, more tertiary treated effluent primarily. Our permits for the creek water are finite as well. And this, this is, Big Sulphur Creek is a tributary of the Russian River. And with the endangered species, the coho salmon and the steelhead, and we've got a lot of issues and a lot of pressures. And, and actually our permits are over time becoming more restrictive. So I, I see that basically going away. And, and so this effluent is becoming more valuable. Okay. And then the second question is, um, would you liken this area as um, a hot, hot, hot spot uh, volcanism? Meaning by that, that it seems that you have a, a gradient in ages in terms of the, uh, of the volcanic ages, and as you move north, your, your volcanics are getting younger, and, and all of a sudden it stops, like right by a that memory month, you don't get any volcanics north of there. Uh, do you think that this is somewhat of a signal of some type of weakened or um, you know, uh, ancient volcanic? It's, it's more, what, what seems to happen is that in the coast ranges, the volcanism gets younger and younger. The Berkeley Hills volcanism is, is older than the, the, in the area, Napa Valley, the Palisades and all that. And then you get to Clear Lake, you've got to go northeast to get into the Cascades. And there is a, a lot of evidence that there's some northeast trending structures in there. I, I don't no, I, I can't say exactly what they are, but um, the, if you notice that heat anomaly was kind of located, it was kind of oriented northeast. There's a lot of faulting in that area that's northeast. 
what's doing it and why it offsets there, I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's definitely, I think, I mean, was, there, there's, there's magma at depth underneath the, in the Clear Lake volcanic area, and that's providing the heat for, uh, for the geysers. When you use the term meteoric water, do you mean primordial water? No, I mean water that originates on the surface as, as rain, streams. Primordial water or volcanic water is, is, uh, is something completely different. Yeah? When you did your um, tritium tracer testing, what were some of the average time frames it took for you to see the tracer come back at the steam? In the, in the real depleted part of the field in the south, we, we would inject tritium and then sample about 24 hours later, and there would already be tritium in the steam. Low levels, but, and close into the injector, but it, oh, uh, maybe a half mile at the most, a couple thousand feet. And so the steam, that, that, that reservoir is just a big steam filled reservoir and, and steam is moving around in response to pressure gradients pretty quick. Um, it, it, it was quick to come, come back to us, but then it would expand out and expand out and expand out. And, and you know, that one curve I showed was actually three years. We have curves which we've run tests for eight months and got 70% of it back. So it's, it's different depending on where you are. And this area where we're putting the Santa Rosa water we really don't have a, that's an area of the field that hasn't been injected in too much. So we don't know what to expect you there. Have you seen an effect from Santa Rosa water? Yeah, the, the non-condensable, that's another thing that, that, that happens is that the, the fresh water, steam is down there containing non-condensable gases, CO2, methane, hydrogen, H2S, and some HCl maybe. And when you interject this fresh water, it boils, it doesn't have any gas in it. It may have a little oxygen or air, nitrogen, but it's basically clean steam. And it sort of shoulders aside the, the, the reservoir steam, so what they see at the power plants is less of the nasty stuff, less of the CO2 and the H2S. And we've seen those gases start to drop in some of the plants. The operators are calling us saying, you know, I don't have to, handled as much gas as I did, and it's just been a week. So I think that's, that's really the first thing. We haven't seen any real steam flow increases. Question? Mm -hmm. um, if I read that earthquake frequency graph correctly, there was a very close correlation between the increase in, in steam production and the earthquakes, and then when the production began to drop, the earthquakes didn't drop. As well. as well. The it's what I showed you there is a curve of the entire field, just a, the entire reservoir. If you look at at it in detail, that production dropped more in certain areas, and the seismicity did decrease, but in, production increased in other areas at the same to kind of offset that. So there's, a, there's a lot going on behind that curve. It's hard to make a conclusion that, you know, that, that character is without really looking at the, the 21 sources of earthquakes. Some of those plants, you shut them down, the earthquakes stop just right away. And other plants, you shut them down and the earthquakes are still going. So it's a, it's a very difficult system to really sort out. Yeah. I think something similar uh, to the earthquake occurs here happened when four engineers they pumped uh, chemical waste into Weaver sandstone and depending upon the frequency and uh, the pressure of application they had several earthquakes and that died after they stopped the pumping. Was this in uh, this Paradox Valley? No, in Colorado? Yeah. yeah. Where they were pumping very high pressures, right. and, and actually fracturing the rock right. with that high hydrostatic pressure, or almost lithostatic. 
But we're not, that, that's different. I think our earthquakes are generated more by thermal effects, contraction and changing in the stress as a result of cooling, not, not a real hydrostatic pressure. I have a medical question. Elsewhere in the world, people went to spas for congestive heart failure or perhaps tuberculosis. But it sounds like they went for a different reason than the geysers. Is this because pioneer Californians had a different spectrum of diseases? <laughs> <laughs> That's easy to reason. I don't know. They uh, certainly were a, a, an, adventurous, an adventuresome group to go all that way. For I mean, that geologist I described who struggled and got up there and then they overcharged him and he didn't really see much. That's, that's kind of what I think, you know. It's, it's not really that big a deal. I'd much rather go to Hot Springs, Arkansas or Yellowstone or someplace like that. But. Any more questions? Anybody else? I have, uh, what do you think is the, if we do this, if we manage to get in a wastewater for 100 years, I mean, for 100% mass replacement, how long do you think the actual heat in place uh, will sustain this field for another 50 years, 100 years? I wouldn't be surprised. About know, I'd, I'd say easily 50. 50 years. Yeah. And now, uh, if you cost for, cost for producing one megawatt of electricity in this field, including reinjection, everything, how does it compare with, say, coal or with uh, oil? I mean, including plant costs, or you're you saying from, from now, from now no, on? Just approximately, your, your Calpine is dealing with this electricity. And so when Calpine does its cost accounting, how much does it find to produce one megawatt of electricity in the geothermal field, as opposed to producing the one megawatt from, say, a conventional thermoelectric power plant like coal-fired or oil fire. Do they have any costing well, estimate? Well, I, I can, I know that, I mean, everybody always tells us that, well, gee, it's, it's pretty inexpensive for you guys because you don't have to buy the fuel. The fuel's right there. And, you know, our, our plants, like our, our natural gas plants that Calpine has all over the U.S., they all have to buy natural gas. And, I mean, today, natural gas prices are soaring, so their costs are very, very high. But our costs aren't zero. We have wells that we have to work over to keep open. We have problems with casing crimping, you know, I was describing that one rock that does that. We have a lot of kind of cost in just keeping things operating. Um, and I would say that it probably, if you, if you blended that all together, it probably costs us about two and a half cents per kilowatt hour to produce, maybe two cents. And, and coal is, well, if you, if you can put in the fuel cost, uh, coal is, is about three cents. It's down, it's pretty low, and it's particularly at the mine mouth, but oil is much more than that. Oils can be four cents, uh, depends on the price of oil. But it's, uh, it's generally more. So, but that's a, that's a difficult question because when you, you, you have to really look at the life cycle costs, you know. If you have a power plant, if you have a 50 megawatt oil fired or gas fired plant, and you look at its operation costs for 30 years, and a geothermal plant whose operation costs for 30 years, uh, I mean, there, the geothermal is less. Yeah, it's still is less. But the geysers geothermal is less. Salt and sea, I'm not convinced. Because this is very high quality. Energy. This is just steam. We have very little, very, very little issue. Salt and sea, they have such operating costs that, you know, it's, it's, it's a different beast. Any more questions? Tom, do you think Santa Rosa will have a big success in selling the uh, water here that you're giving water to the vineyards? Gallo's already taken it. Yeah. yeah, and but you know these high-end vineyards—they're pretty snobby. I'm not sure they'd 
want to have the want to have the moniker of you know effluent irrigated <laughs> grapes, but it really to human beings. That's a whole different story. <laughs> With that, but Gallup doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.